morning, everyone. I'm uh, going to be doing uh, from paragraph 564 of Answer to Job. Uh, this is the, this is the version I'm working working with, and I see I have to correct my sound system just a moment. Okay, uh, that way I don't hear myself talking in my own ears. <laughs> Very irritating. Um, so anyway, uh, answer to Job at the beginning is talking about uh, Yahweh. And he's basically talking about the... Um, analysis, an analysis of the personality of Yahweh. And so basically, it, what it comes down to is uh, a God who's an author authoritarian versus a God who's more democratic and more uh, attuned with people's needs. And so it's a, a very interesting uh, passage here that we're going to read today. And so I'm going to begin uh, with uh, well into uh, answer to Job. This is actually after Job has been whipped, whip up, whipped up upon by Yahweh for uh, numerous times. And finally, in uh, Job 40, Five, four through five. This is the footnote here. Job, Job 40, verses four through five. Um, Job answers Yahweh thus. This is paragraph 564. Job is speaking to Yahweh. <clears throat> and he says, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer thee? I lay my hand upon my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. And so um, what Job is responding here basically is he's faced by an authoritarian, authoritarian God. Uh, and that authoritarian God uh, treats Job any way he jolly well pleases, uh, like some of our uh, politicians around the world. Who have, we have many of them. We have them in the United States, of course, but we have Putin in Russia and uh, Erdogan in Turkey, Bolsonaro in Brazil and Kim Jong-il in, um, in North Korea. And they basically behave on only on the power principle, only what's good for them. And they don't very often worry about their people. And so Job uh, sees that, that Yahweh, the Old Testament God uh, that he's been confronted with, uh, this is 500 BC, of course, um, Yahweh is basically that sort of uh, personality. And so then uh, we read paragraph 565, and indeed in the immediate presence of the infinite power of creation, this is the only possible answer for a witness who is still trembling in every limb with the terror of almost total annihilation. What else could a half-crushed human worm groveling in the dust reasonably answer in the circumstances? In spite of his pitiable littleness and feebleness, this man knows that he is confronted with a superhuman being who is personally most easily provoked. He also knows that it is far better to withhold all moral reflections, to say nothing of certain moral requirements which might be expected to apply to a, to a God. 
And so here, uh, Job is recognizing that uh, the God that had been developed by the uh, Jewish community in the years after Abraham, and th this included the early, the people who became Muslims later uh, and Christians, um, because all three are Abrahamic religions, uh, that God is amoral and it's necessary to uh, recognize that there's both good and evil in this God. Uh, and Job is 500 years ahead of his uh, fellow human beings in this respect, uh, but that's what he is doing. Um, and he recognizes that this God can deliver hurricanes and tornadoes, uh, floods and all sorts of uh, mayhem based on the weather. Um, and so then we go on, paragraph 566. Yahweh is justice, is praise. So presumably Job could bring his complaint and to the protestations of it and the protestations of his innocence before him. Turning the page, my book is quite dog eared, so <laughs> it, uh, it's a mess. So uh, let's see, I'll read that sentence again. Yahweh's justice is praised, so presumably Job could bring his complaint and the protestation of his innocence before him as a just judge. But he doubts this possibility. How can a man be just before God? If I summoned him and he answered me, I would not believe that he was listening to my voice. If it is a matter of justice, who can summon him? His, he multiplies my wounds without cause. He destroys both the blameless and the wicked. If the scourge slay suddenly, he will laugh at the trial of the innocent. I know, Job says to Yahweh, thou wilt not hold me innocent. I shall be condemned. Uh, if I wash myself never so clean, yet shalt thou plunge me in the ditch. For he is not a man as I am and should answer him. Uh, he is not a man as I am that I should answer him and he should come together in judgment. Job wants to explain his point of view to Yahweh to state his complaint and tells him, thou knowest that I am not guilty and there is none to deliver out of thy hand. I desire to argue my case with God. I will defend my ways to his face. I know that I shall be vindicated. Yahweh should summon him, summon him and render him an account or at least allow him to plead his case. Uh, properly estimating the disproportion between man and God, he asks, will thou break a leaf driven to and fro and wilt thou pursue the dry stubble? God has put him in the wrong, but there is no justice. He has taken away my right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from him. I hold fast to my righteousness and will not let it go. His friend Elihu, the, the, Bur, the Buzite, <laughs> the Buzite, very good, B-U-Z-I-T-E. His friend Elihu, the Buzite, does not believe the injustice of Yahweh. Oh, of a truth, God will not do wickedly and the Almighty will not pervert justice. Illogically enough, he bases his opinion on God's power. Is it fit to say to a king, thou art wicked, and to princes, ye are ungodly? One must respect the persons of princes and esteem the high more than the low. But Job is not shaken in his faith and had already uttered an important truth when he said, behold my witnesses in heaven, 
and he that vouches for me is on high. My eye pours out tears to God that he would maintain the right of a, of a man with God, like that of a man with his neighbor. And later, for I know that my vindic, uh, vindicative, vindicator, uh, for I know that my vindicator lives, and at last he will stand upon the earth. Okay, so this is Job uh, denying, uh, first of all, Elihu's statement. Just a minute, I need to allow Jordan to join the conversation here. <clears throat> Okay, Jordan, I'm trying to admit you, but, but the, oh, here we go. Okay, now you're in rejoining. Welcome. Um, good morning. Good morning. I got a head start on you here. And um, you're on 566, 567. 566. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Tara Poldle, uh please hold your comments on Bitcoin uh, until later in the day. Uh, I'm happy to discuss it at some point, but um, I, I wanna get through a bit of this answer to Job first. And so I have uh, blown ahead of you, uh, Jordan, and I'm up, I've read through 566 and um, in 566, uh, Job says one important thing, that Yahweh is not a man, uh, for he is not a man as, as I am, uh, that I should answer him and he should come together in judgment. Uh, and later in this passage is where um, he's talking about uh, Elihu the Buzite, who says, well, you know, God is blameless. And so, um, so you must have done something wrong, basically. That's sort of toward the end of paragraph uh, 566. And, um, and the point is to recognize, and also I've been making the comparison between authoritarian and democratic leaders, uh, because Jung makes that comparison here in a bit uh, between the kings and average people. Um, and so we have many uh, authoritarian leaders around the world and they're basically interested in their own interests. They're not interested in the people. And uh, if you get in their way, uh, they're going to crush you. Uh, and this is the way um, Yahweh um, behaves as an authoritarian leader. Um, and humanity is starting to get the idea that maybe that isn't good enough. And, and that's what Job represents. Go ahead, Jordan. Oh, I was going to say that that's a really good point with the author authoritarian aspect. And then also when he says, uh, thou art wicked, and to princes, ye are ungodly. One must respect the persons of princes and esteem the high more than the low. And what's interesting about that is that's inverted authoritarianism called democracy rather than democracy. And what's interesting about that is um, when the people still support the, the one in quote unquote charge instead of the one who's leading. So authoritarianism kiboshes, whereas then the not inverted authoritarianism is leadership. But without that, it's, it's simply inverted authoritarianism guised in alleged justice and equanimity. Right. And, and so, you know, both are bad, uh, occasionally. Um, and so, you know, basically we need 
uh, maturity, I would say, where where our leaders recognize what the people need. I mean, this is what we hope comes from democracy, that, that leaders will be interested in our interests as opposed to not giving a fig for them. And, uh, and here Jung goes on and talks about this in a, in a few par- a couple paragraphs later. But, um, you know, the point is that, um, you know, we have President Putin in Russia, who it's going to, based on his whim, uh, kill tens of thousands of people. Okay, that's like the behavior of, um, of Yahweh, as he was seen by, um, by the people uh, at that time. So Elihu was saying, you know, he's the boss so you just have to go with go with that and job is saying no no wait a minute god has a good side and a bad side and let me make my case to the good side and you know i've i've certainly experienced this um in my own life um where i was in this foreclosure case where um, they changed the plaintiff four times on me, just totally arbitrarily. I have no idea what, what their justification was for that. And the court simply let them do it time and time again. And finally, um, I had to put my hand across my mouth and shut up because um, uh, they didn't care about what I had to say or about my rights. They um, and the point is that they had to protect a system that had been developed in a, in an arbitrary way, uh, without it being, uh, changed by legislation. It had been just changed by force of, uh, experience over a couple hundred years, I guess, in the U S. And so the judges were in charge of protecting that system and they didn't care about a, a, an ant like me. And so finally I had to recognize that that was the case and just stop fighting. And um, well, that's a wonderful point too, because if I respell ant, A-U-N-T, um, there's the family aspect of the mentor, tormentor of the people who are older than you. And in this sense, you, 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 you nailed it when you said that we need maturity in leadership because we don't need a substitute parent. People still, you know, baby's, birth, baby's mouth up, feed me, feed me, feed me. And instead of jumping the nest and doing it on your own, um, we need ourselves each to be the mentor, tormentor of ourselves. So we, beyond becoming, the, you know, child becoming the parent of the adult, man, woman, or otherwise, Um, there is no substitute parent. We need to be the parent. And so Job is looking to have a direct conversation with the now colleague of the divine, the peer, after he has matured, instead of the, I just need to bow to the system and then contribute at this lower, as you said, A&T, ant level, um, or not. And so I guess, uh, and, the, the, and so what I was recognizing in my in my maturity is okay. When I was a young law student and a young lawyer, I had all these dreams of everything being just and proper and ruled by the law, and I actually was getting whiffs of of this kind of problem in the law. Uh, early on, which is why I stopped practicing law. I did not like Mm -hmm. um, the way law is administered in the United States. And and so, uh, but what I didn't realize was that's what judges do. They have to, they have to make a judgment about what has to be done. And 
I understood early on that if I won my case, that um, it would apply to every um, clerk's office in every county in America. In other words, these frauds that I unearthed um, had been going on for a century or more, probably more, in every county courthouse. And so if the court ruled for me, they were going to have to sweep away everything and the economy would collapse. I actually recognized that very early on in my process, but I said, wait a minute, I have, I have rights here too. And this is, you know, these people are lying. This is fraudulent, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, finally I had to recognize that the reason the laws had not been changed to reflect the obvious was that it was just too big a lift. It was too heavy a lift to do in the legislature. And so the courts just did it as fait accompli. And so in maturity, I had to recognize that, you know, I just got screwed and that's the way it is. That, that's what happened to 10 million American families who lost their homes um, and their life savings and lots of others, not only in foreclosure, but in, in other ways. In the crash of 2008, it's not fair. And, um, you know, El Elihu says it's fair, but um, because, you know, that's the way rulers are. And I say it's not fair, but we have to accept it as, as in our maturity, we have to accept it and, f you know, find ways to make society better in ways that we can change. Uh, well, you know, that's a good point because um, it's, you know, instead of the golden rule, it's those who have the gold rule. Yeah. And, <laughs> right. and I remember... I remember in 1992, <laughs> 1993, um, you know, I was, I was deep in the middle of my five-year break from architecture and talking to a friend of mine who was an L3, you know, third-year law student at UVA, and he was doing his internship at the White House. And um, I said something about, well, but that's just not right. He goes... Yeah, you need to come out under, from under that pesky idealism, Iraq. It's not a justice system. It's a legal system. And, and that was where I really paused and realized it's not the golden rule. It is for me, but it's those who have the gold rule. And, um, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, that there's a real dynamism there that has to do with youth and maturity but both because the maturity part is dynamic and empathic and listening, but it's not the, I make the rules you're grounded listening of a parent. It's the, we're going to have a discussion and let's decide the value instead of establishing the value for everybody else via currency of money instead right. of currency of value. Right. And so the early Jews and good morning, Joel, nice to see you this morning. Morning. Um, Good morning, Skip. Good yeah. morning, Jordan. So the, Good morning. the early Jews were simply accepting the authoritarian God. And um, what, what Christ brought in was that, that God was good. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it, we got the church. Uh, saying that there is no evil, okay, <laughs> for ba basically the church saying there is no evil for about 2,000 years. And uh, it had its benefits because, uh, among other things, it allowed Western civilization to develop from where it had been under Roman, you know, pure power, power principle rules. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, so, so having the purely good God uh, that Christ brought in um, was useful. It allowed civilization to develop and allowed people to commit themselves for their lives, to build uh, cathedrals, for example, 
uh, you know, a typical cathedral, as we've said, took three generations to build. So the people who, who started a, uh, a cathedral, it normally took a hundred years by tradition. Um, people who started a cathedral never saw it finished. And, um, and so, uh, well, that know, brings up the you point know, they were willing to commit to this good God. And so the civilization did develop, even though there were pretty uh, sick ideas within that civilization, like the Inquisition. Go ahead, Jordan. Yeah, I was going to say that brings up the, the point of maturity begins in the ability and the original thought to plant a tree that you know you will never experience its shade. And it's going to come later. You're doing something for the community at large rather than for your own personal benefit, benefit and gain now. And I think the second point that brings up is um, there's a lot of you know, anti-Semitic you know, Jewish racism about money. And there's the, those who have the gold rule. Well, those also who manage the gold, the people who rule, rule the rulers. And you had, you had the money changers was a job that nobody wanted. I mean, that's like our immigrants and our immigration policies and such. Well, the Jewish people became the money changers. Mm -hmm. So they managed the gold that the rulers ruled with. Well, in that comes another hidden default of control in a sense that masks the rulership because they're being tugged on from their purse strings, whereas other people want to tug on the heart strings. And then they say, well, then that doesn't make any money. So they can push it aside again based on they can blame storm down to, well, who's running the money? And they, they get, in a sense, actually not in a sense, they get actually um, more control by having someone else manage your money. Because then it's not them. They can blame someone who mismanaged their money when they didn't mismanage the money. They just didn't manage it the way that it was going from their totalitarian or authoritarian methods. Right. And, and uh, I'll challenge anyone who's watching this either now or in the future to go and read Answer to Job and, and compare Yahweh to um, Donald Trump. Okay. Because in effect, uh, we hired, uh, we elected a, an authoritarian leader who cared not a fig for any of us. Mm -hmm. All he cared about was power and his own life. And I, we don't find any evidence in his, uh, in his presidency that I can point to where he cared about the rest of us. And, um, and nice pun with a fig. I mean, cause it's, if there's a more, it's like a medjool date, you know, the, right. the pit's going to still be in there, but it's impotent. It right. can't grow so, anything. So if we, if we um, re-elect him, that means we've regressed to uh, the way the early Jews were who wanted an authoritarian God. Except there's one difference, which is that Job, 500 years BC, realized that Yahweh has two sides. He has a good side and a bad side, and that he could make his case to the good side of God, and that's what he was trying to do here. And um, and this is what Elihu in this chapter or in this paragraph uh, did not understand. El Elihu said, "You know, the guys in power are always right," and um, and. Job said, no, not necessarily. I can, I can uh, plead my case to the good side of God and, um, and make some progress. Whereas, um, you know, the Jews had accepted, um, you know, a, a Yahweh that was completely denying anybody's rights. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. And I think if, you know, if, if, if that certain person gets reelected, then the White House 
just should need first order of policy to have an outhouse. That way, at least he'll have to eat his own paper instead of trying to flush it. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, that's that's a little diversion to politics, which some some people like. I actually did a poll on this YouTube channel um, some years ago now, where I asked the question, you know, do you want what do you want more in this? in this uh, YouTube channel. And by far, uh, maybe like something like 56% versus spiritual guidance or whatever, 56% wanted more current affairs politics. <laughs> and and uh, like 20% wanted spiritual guidance or whatever well you know what's interesting about that is i think that's i think it's important because it's instead of the you know okay what's your two paragraphs about what did you do this summer you know in elementary school which is current events but they're current events that are catchy you know current events that are they're fine but they're going to disappear after you finish talking and the next person starts there what did you do this summer it's like show and tell um it's whatever is on the soundbite news stream now, but the relating to current political events done with substance marries spiritual events with it, with value. And they don't have to be coded as political or spiritual. There is a life affirming gig. That's, Absolutely. that's, com that's community Absolutely. service. Absolutely. And instead of, you know, the LOE, um, who is basically deferring authority, personal authority to an authoritarian, i.e. Yeah. a substitute parent. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so let's go on and uh, we can read another paragraph. And then uh, meanwhile, I'll say some other things. But uh, I, I remember. Part... Go yeah. ahead, uh, Joel. Yeah, go ahead. I remember that uh, before uh, in the year that uh, Trump for, was running for the presidency with uh, uh, the people of uh, C.G. Young Institute of Chicago uh, Publish a, a good book about uh, Donald Trump, and there is a chapter in this book. I don't remember the name of the book, but the chapter is about the the uh, Trump as the next uh, an expression of the. The cowboy archetype, and it, uh, I remember that there is very interesting uh, points uh, in this book. I don't remember the this book, but it, uh, uh, I think that the the people that uh, published the, the this book they they made a point, a very good point. That's, that's what I would like to, to say. So, so Joel, um, would you uh, define the cowboy archetype? Uh, what, what are its features in your view? Um, it's like... Uh, pistols. Guns, uh, um, there is no dialogue. Uh, I, I, I'm not um, feeling, uh, I'm not totally secure to configure this, but uh, I, I promise that I, I will read this, this chapter of this book. Yeah. Could I uh, could I refer to you to the to the new American movie entitled uh, Power of the Dog? Have you seen this movie? Have the you power? seen it, Jordan? Mm, I've not. 
Okay. Um, I, I would add, uh, and I want to, before you go on to, to Joel's point with the cowboy, um, there are to me two versions of the cowboy archetype. And one of them is the American mystic cowboy, disconnected from others and connected to the land. They understand nature will kill you. So there's a wisdom there. But they're out, you know, alone, riding, as the eagles would say, you know, riding the fences, uh, so to speak, way out. But there's also the other point, which is the cowboy justice, which is pull the pistols out and, you know, shoot first, ask questions later, because then you ask fewer questions. And um, I find that um, Trump is a direct subset of one part of the cowboy archetype that shows how much trauma will actually distort a brain lifelong. And I mean, in, in his defense, not to defend him, but just from a dispassionate and psychological viewpoint, um, monster of a father and a doormat of a mother. So he never had any balance in anything except four wheel drive pistol over everybody, no boundaries, nothing developed. It was just, instead of power, it was simply assertion aggression mm -hmm. instead of being assertive in an empathic way. If, if that speaks to Joel's, you know, the cowboy archetype from right. that, I mean, thoughts, the, I mean, Joel, the reason from, I mentioned, um, power of the dog is it's exactly on this point, okay. uh, which is about um, two brothers uh, in, um, in Montana uh, in 1925 who own a ranch. And they have uh, 12 cow hands who, uh, who, you know, are basically cowboys. They're out there with no women among them. Uh, and, of course, the cowboy uh, was always in threat of his life. Okay. Right. And so he had to have, uh, you know, a gun handy uh, to take on the rattlesnake or what have you. And, um, you know, this is spoken to very, very powerfully in this movie. I wouldn't be surprised to see it win the Academy Award because um, it really speaks to you know what is justice and and what can happen to you and you know mm -hmm. it, an amoral Yahweh among other things <clears throat> and um, it really asks a lot of questions and um, and so I would urge everyone to take a look at that um, And so, yes, there is a certain cowboy archetype there, uh, but, you know, it's a cowboy archetype that just is in for himself, okay? He's there for himself. All he's got is a saddle and his rifle and his pistol. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's got to eke out a living, and so it has to be all for him, you know, whenever he... Mm -hmm. does it it has to be all for him and um you know he doesn't pay any attention to anyone else and certainly there you know there has been over history need for such people uh but at the by the same token there also has been need for people who create civilization you know and that's i think that i'm um, I look forward to seeing that movie because that mess, every cowboy I've met is worth their salt, so to speak. Um, they know nature will kill you and they're in it for themselves as a matter of life affirming self care. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they need to do what needs to be done. So in that there's an inherent sense of personal responsibility that is bred simply in the work in the line of work of their job. But then you switch to the other and there's a, instead of nature will kill you, there's, oh, everybody's out to get me. So there's a paranoia aspect, which is childish, whereas a cowboy will be childlike because they need to be fluid no matter how rigid they are. And so they will always make spontaneous decisions in the defense of life 
rather than the, the defense of being right. And I think that's the that chief difference too about the certain person we're pre-POTUS or post-POTUS that we're talking about versus someone who's actually living with the land, on the yeah. land. They don't have the luxury of, of being all nice, nice. They're kind. Yeah. And I find that they're, they don't pull punches. They're straight up honest um, to the point of being Winston Churchill level insulting with their humor. And, and they don't mean any ill will with it. They're just, yeah. they're just observing and speaking what they observe. And so I think there's, a, there's an honesty there that has that sense of personal responsibility. You're, you're really going to like this movie, Jordan. <laughs> nice. <laughs> because, for example, uh, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch uh, plays the, plays the uh, tough but um, mature, individuated um, brother. Mm. Nice. <laughs> and so the movie begins with him taking care of his uh, his cowboys, his 12 cowboys that work on the ranch, uh, you know, he just walks into the, the main ranch house and, and says to the wife of his brother, we'll be 12 for dinner. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and uh, you know, she doesn't have any choice but to produce the 12 meals. And it isn't that he's, you know, gushy, that, that he's gushy giving a handout. He is doing what a rancher needed to do um, on the ranch to keep his men working for him, basically. Uh, well, then is, is she then the Jesus character and he's Paul and they're the 11 other apostles plus him? I mean, is there a kind of... One, a... one could argue that. That would be an interesting... Okay. <laughs> That'd be an interesting thing to see. The divine uh, feminine right back in the Cowboys. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and meanwhile, the, the other brother is just oblivious to it all. <clears throat> and um, so he's Pontius. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> yeah. And and so I'll I'll just leave it at that for the moment. Okay. Probably that sounds what? Probably I we'll have to that. discuss this movie in detail after the Academy Awards <laughs> come out. I, d I don't want to. Nice. I don't want to be a uh, a spoiler. So Spoil. spoiler. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> it's um. <clears throat> well, I like you didn't you didn't do a spoiler. You, you did an enticer. Um, that yes, that might be. <laughs> so I still have to see it before we right. watch it. And as well, yeah. Zen Mo model says, uh, Christ saying the meek will inherit the earth, the world, the earth, uh, certainly materialized in the Wild West, uh, just as it came out of the Bronze Age as well. Yes, exactly. And uh, for our Russian friend here who's deciding to promote something I don't want promoted on this youtube channel i'm saying goodbye to that individual uh and uh with respect you can take your individuation somewhere else uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know people who do that kind of stuff um are are just immature to the max and uh well i think that comes to back grow to the, up. it comes back to the cowboy where that's to me where i really I mean, on a ranch um, in North Texas, I'm probably kindergarten. It didn't come to me until decades later, but, you know, they, they said, don't stare the lead goat or any male goat in the eye. Um, it's all about ego and pecking order. And it doesn't matter that pecking order is bad order. Um, it's just what it is. And well, what's the first thing I'm going to do? I mean, they're teaching me a lesson by telling me don't do that. Mm -hmm. So first thing I do is I go into the corral and, you know, I stare down the goat. Well, I stare down the goat for about two seconds before it head head butts me right in the stomach, puts me right on my rumpus on the ground. And it walks away. It's done what it needed to do. They don't accept a challenge. They take yeah. it out before it happens. And so what's interesting there is the um, the all ego goat piece is is unevolved for leadership. 
that's that's the right hand man taking care of business kind of thing but it shouldn't be the person sitting in the chair and and that that to me is interesting because um later you learn that yes things need to be done without fail without pause there's the goat but the reality is there's the let's look at what the long-term view of this getting done is going to do. Are you going to stifle a future good idea or are you pulling a weed out of the garden? I mean, so there's the value judgment way in there, which is childish, which is childlike rather than childish. The goat alone is childish. But you can't teach a a child a, a lesson by logic. And right. it's it's interesting your experience because um, there are other parts of psychology other than Jungian psychology. I'll have to acknowledge that, and one of them is neuro linguistic programming. And right. I, according according to the rules of neuro linguistic programming, uh, if you say "Don't do something," "Don't stare at the goat." that amounts yeah. to a command to you mm-hmm. to stare at the goat. Okay. Yeah, don't think about an elephant. And well, yeah. what do you do for the next half, six, eight hours, half a day? All you can think of is the elephant, white elephant, pink elephant, gray elephant, <laughs> exactly. a, a live elephant, yeah. dead elephant. <laughs> yeah. A lot of adjectives, but there's always elephants. Yeah, so so people do not hear a negative. Right. And, and um, or, or I should rephrase it, people fail to hear a negative. And, and that's the same with training dogs and animals. You, yeah. you can't you can't say don't do something. They don't understand. They understand action. Yeah. And what's interesting is, I think the whole argument of you know animals don't have consciousness is a misnomer. Well, they have consciousness, but it's as fast as a lightning strike, and their in their intuition and instinct and experience has a judging moment that's like as long as a cork. It's yes. in and out and gone. And they respond. Yeah, to, it's like to stay uh, alive. And how, how, how do you house train a dog? Uh, it's very simple. You grab the dog by the scruff of the neck, put their nose in their own poop, and get yourself over him uh, so that you're behind him and growl, go Arr! like that. And uh, after you do that one time. They're pretty much house trained. That's my experience. There's that method. There's also a friend of mine who's a dog trainer. And what she will do is she will spend four days in a tent in the yard. And the dog never spoils the nest, the tent, on purpose. They just instinctively don't want to soil the nest. They don't look at the home as a nest until they live outside for three or four days. And they only go in the yard. Well, then they go inside. They're accustomed to going in the yard. So they always want to go outside. So there's the second method that goes right with the other one. So there's the, there's the corrective method and then a natural method. But they, well, they like you said, they both work. And there's a different teaching methods. Well, yeah. And, and uh, the direct method is much more effective and, and efficient. Uh, yeah, you could teach a dog to, you could house train a dog that way, but I would say that's the girl's way of doing it. Well, I, I would, I actually, I think it's the natural way. And I would have to beg to disagree that I think it, it's a not a better way to stand over and growl. That's teaching by parenting rather than teaching by nature. I'll kill you and teaching what's there. I mean, because to me, Yes, what happens is it's an inconvenience. I mean, I don't want to live for three days. I don't want to take that time off. I don't want to miss work, you know, to deal with potty training. But it's a natural way. It's a vision quest. It's a yeah, rite okay. of passage. Well, fair, fair enough. I, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll agree to gris, disagree. Yeah. And we'll agree that both types work. And some things need to be taught in that way um, yeah and it's it's kind of a both and and it depends on yeah. you know how do you want to interrupt or include in your schedule these tasks that you're about to perform i mean and then you make the judgment as to which one you do um i'll be right back uh, now, and refill now, my it, coffee okay anders says that veterinaries give animals anesthesia during operations which indicates that we assume 
animals have consciousness. Um, and Zen says, without a doubt, dolphins have consciousness. Uh, and also uh, whales and every other creature on the planet at some level. Um, and uh, the question, I guess, is whether they have discriminating consciousness um, and, you know, whether we're, and at the moment, that's why we rule the planet, <laughs> because we are able to differentiate and, uh, and their method uh, speaking to, unfortunately, this is speaking to jo Jordan's point without him present, so I'll, I'll save it. Let me read the next uh, uh, paragraph of answer to Job, and then we'll continue. So before you do, I, I kind of heard the trail end of that, or the first part of that comment that about veterinarians, veterinarians giving animals anesthesia assuming they have consciousness and that's interesting because then that equates consciousness with the ability to feel pain. Um, and that's kind of basic. And yeah. I think that's outside the realm of the philosophy of conscience or the, you know, right. well, let, let me uh, point out that the consciousness is, uh, whether it's fast or slow, we'll talk about Yahweh here because uh, Dr. Young speaks about in, in uh, Memory Streams Reflections, he speaks about his trip to uh, Africa, his first trip to Africa, when he went up on Mount Elgon with a party. And uh, while he was in the camp, he decided to take himself away from the rest of his party and just be alone. And so he went up on this higher place where he couldn't see his party and all he could see uh, in front of him was these rivers of other creatures going by wildebeest and all other types of creatures that you would find in the Serengeti and um, he, he realized that that Yahweh was not very conscious basically because he said mm -hmm. Yahweh took hundreds of millions of years to create this okay and so all mm -hmm. these species developed with a rather dim consciousness which, which we would call evolution today but um but the the consciousness of of evolution is a very slow process taking hundreds of millions of years. And here he was as the only discerning consciousness seeing that, that human being is seeing the difference about human beings that our uh, consciousness is You froze right there with consciousness. Um, I answer to Job, which is God is amoral. He's not, um, he's not making a moral decision about evolution. He's just letting it happen. And, and yeah, and that so, is amoral, not immoral. And there's right. a distinction. And it's interesting. I remember getting kicked out of a graduate level psychology class that was a seminar on cognition yeah and the reason was and the dean was was teaching the class so it was it was kind of cut and dry there was no administration it was mr hoggard please leave um and what it was is i kept asking the phd question of you know sir is this aristotle or plato with the unmoved mover this is a seminar on cognition but what is the conscious driver of the cognition and you know the this is more about epistemology, the science of how we know things, cognition, rather than what's the heart of the matter, driving the cognition. And that was outside clearly the bounds. And I was out of bounds. Um, I know that now, but I was out of the bounds for the syllabus of the class, but not for the discussion. 
And it's interesting there with the young on high, amoral, not immoral, just allowing things to occur. That is, you know, devoid of morals. Morals were not even in that situation. They're just occurrence, experience. Um, letting things play out as it would be. Um, there's a difference between consciousness and cognition. And I think that's a, that's a clear point that Job is up against, whereas Eloi, Elo, that's, that's cognition. Job is being conscious. Right. Now, I'm, I'm going to quickly read Anders and Zen modems, modals, Zen modes uh, comment here, and then let's go on. Okay. Uh, Anders says it would be scary to only give muscle paralyzing injections during operations uh, with our consciousness still being active, at least for us humans and maybe for ha- animals too, certainly. And uh, they used to give give guys uh, a piece of leather to bite on while they amputated their, their arms and legs, uh, for example, before anesthesia, uh, not good. Well, and people, people often have to heal surgery trauma that was unconscious, physically unconscious, because the body still recognizes the pain. It just can't respond. And it's, in a sense, it's it's more convenient for the doctors to not listen to the screaming. They can focus more easily. Right. Okay, but, so Zen, says, Zen mode says, when Skip says tetragrammation, which is Java, uh, was not fully conscious, we could say that collective unconscious uh, was certainly not fully and still isn't to this day integrated and individuated. I agree entirely with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's his it was point. The bronze, yeah, it was the Bronze Age. As the times get better, the gods get kinder. The original gods were cruel. Uh, now, for many in the States, it is a father figure. Uh, the gods get kinder as civilization gets safer. Uh, really good observations there. Okay, that is, now because wanna... the unconscious isn't evolutionary or anti-evolutionary it's not moral or immoral the amoral is it doesn't need to be conscious and that's its whole point which we can go to five six or seven right now let's uh, but i want to go back to the last sentence of uh, 566 where job says and this uh, passage is contained in job 19 25 uh, about the redeemer Job says, for I know that my vindicator lives and at last he will stand upon the earth, unquote. Okay, so this is Job, 500 years before Christ, knowing that in the collective there was a tendency that would ultimately result in Christ and ultimately result in Carl Jung, because Carl Jung is, after all, vindicating Job in his book, Answer to Job. That's what he's doing. But That's a really good point to go back to that last sentence, because at last he will stand upon the earth. There's, I think in the footnote, it probably indicates this, but that's the advocate that is physically, experientially present consciously right next to us, yeah. tangible yeah, touch, so, feel, stand upon the earth, rather than yeah, so in the be this abstract note, divine the vindicator, vindicator in the RSV alternative reading for Redeemer, and comes very close to the uh, Zurich Bible advocate. Right. And so, in other words, Job has become conscious that there would be a redeemer and and this makes uh, zen modes uh comments very good here yes uh, where he, he's saying you know um as times get better the gods get kinder and um, absolutely and Andrew says yes even in the bible god had to be like a stern parent in the beginning to keep humanity in line i guess aha uh-huh. and then later christ came with a gentle gentler message yes definitely um and and now we're 
now we're entering a new stage of consciousness. So this is what, uh, this was Edinger's um, insight that in Judaism, um, the God was the lawgiver, the Ten Commandments and so on. So it was mm -hmm. the law uh, and that allowed Jews to survive for uh, a couple thousand years BC. But then there was a need for a gentler uh, society, which is what Christ represented. And so that has been the last 2000 years. But then that started to crumble because of the scientific method about 500 years ago, which started to say, well, that's not true, and that's not true, and that's not true. And uh, if which kind familiar, of becomes a four year old, <laughs> you right. know, the no and why, and, and, no and why. Right, right. And so, so the result is that many people lost their faith because, you know, certain aspects of the religion were proven untrue, and therefore people said that. Ah, you know, and they went over to the logos and rationality entirely. But the fact is that they are true, but they're true in a metaphorical sense. And it took Jung and a few others to start to recognize that, um, you know, these things are true. So, okay, Nietzsche was sort of the end of the last era, era where he was observing what had happened. He said, God is dead. And what he meant was that God is dead. Um, but Jung came along and amplified on that. In the next generation, he found where God lives and how God goes about doing the business of the Godhead. That's what he found. And so that God lives, that's the living God. And so for those of you on YouTube who, um, who don't know this, uh, I actually did a lecture on finding the living God uh, in October of 2019, which you can find on the, on the um, uh, YouTube channel, uh, just on the homepage of the YouTube channel. So uh, let's, well, that, let's go I'm on. glad you brought up Nietzsche at that point, right before Jung, right before we go on, because there's the, that's the child of society becoming its own parent, the, the birth of that onset of the end of adolescence. And I remember arguments with my dad being kiboshed because he wasn't going to play opposing counsel in the courtroom with me. He's like, I'm not your friend. I'm your dad. We can be friends when we're peers and colleagues. And what that was, was that was the, as times get better, the gods get kinder. We were always yeah. close, but as a leader and a mentor, that was very clear with a capital right. L and a capital M. Later, um, he's like, wow, you, you really were stubborn. It took a lot longer for me to get through to you. Yeah. And I know, I know I never have. So there's a whole parenting piece of teaching someone how to become their own parent. Right. And it's, and so the next phase after Christ, which was uh, was belief and faith, belief, uh, and we need faith, but belief means that you're following somebody else, what somebody else says. But faith well, is is a different thing. So I, I remember have faith, but not belief in in the physical nature of the Bible. I believe it's 100 percent true, but it's true in the unconscious. It's not true in the physical world necessarily. I mean, certain, mm -hmm. certain aspects to the, to the extent that they're uh, historical certainly are true, <clears throat> including you know, the dreams and visions that various people had. Um, those are certainly true. But, um, and the reason they're true and the way I know it's true is um, if Moses didn't have that vision of God telling him what the Ten Commandments were, um, anyway, lots of 
you know, millions of people, billions of people since the time of Moses have believed it's true and therefore it is true in their psyches. Um, right. And, and that can't be denied. And so the point that Edinger made now was the next step after the law and after belief. And so therefore after the scientific method is psychology, that's the only way to get to uh, understand the gods and therefore accept them um, is through psychology. And it, that you know, was... I, I, rem <clears throat> I remember in an Boy. interview several years ago where I, I just, someone was asking about faith and belief and, and I simply said, well, it's really easy to misplace your faith when you follow the convincing rather than the facts. And, and I got it, but I realized a couple of years later when I heard Jung say, I have no need of belief. I have a deep knowing. I went, aha, I was still trapped in my belief. I was just philosophically defeating the belief by logic, knowing there was something else but not owning that the unconscious was a real tangible thing and going to the deep knowing. So when I heard Jung say, I, I, have, a, I, I have a deep knowing, I mean, that was to me, I went, aha, because it took me from, I stepped out of the egg of belief. I cracked that. But then I'm in a no man's land because I didn't really go to the, oh, my unconscious is important. I knew creativity was important, but I was still hanging out around here rather than invoking that divine piece of the deep knowing, which is a fact instead of a convincing. Right. And uh, well, go ahead, uh, Joel. I, I think that the, the, the great point uh, you made uh, while he was traveling in Africa uh, <laughs> was about the conscience of the conscience. Uh, I think that you realized something like that while he was in Africa, the conscience of the conscience. And uh, the great point in the answer to Job is that Job could not be the answer to himself. Job is not the answer. And Isaac, the son of Abraham, uh, is not the answer. Uh, because uh, um, if uh, we follow Dr. Berenger, um encounter with the self, what we uh, realize is that Christ as the son of God is the answer uh, to Job as a process of historical coagulation process. The incarnatus est, the, the, the logos became in uh, flesh. Uh, and uh, the answer to Job, Job in the book of Job uh, did not came in the form of an answer, but in the way of 70 questions that God himself asks to Job. And I think that in a psychological uh, perspective, this is very significant. Yeah. This is meaningful. Yeah. And uh, it, uh, about uh, psychology, <clears throat> you told, when you told about uh, Dr. Edinger and about psychology and about Descartes too, uh, I think that... Um, the, the method of Descartes, that uh, uh, Descartes was very, uh, how could I say that in English? 
Descartes was very Descartesian, Descartesianized by the people who came after Descartes, because when we read Descartes uh, in the original, uh, Descartes talks about the imagination. And so the people that came after Descartes put off, uh, uh, I think that they, they took a scissor, oh, let's cut the imagination thing in, in Descartes. But Descartes uh, writes about the imagination in his method, uh, La Methode, and uh, um, uh, I think that you, you made a point. Uh, what came to me now is that we have to follow the logos generated by psyche itself. And that is what I call psychology. The logos generated by psyche itself, and we must develop uh, uh, um, our senses. Uh, eyes and ears to, to, to realize that. Is, that's it. It's, yeah, that's a wonderful um, point about Descartes, because they, you know, I think therefore I am, but they amputated the imagination, which he was clearly yes. interested in. Like even in an essence plastic the kind of colorage way. Yeah, he amputated the imagination. And I love what you're saying. Wonderful. Jesus as the coagulatio okay. of God via Job. Yes. It's, that's the coming into being. Or Job is the one who at last will stand upon the earth. But yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. Because philosophy, you know, <clears throat> logic, if P, then Q, capital R, Greek reason, has nothing to do with imagination because that's folly. Well, I can't make any money with that. <laughs> It doesn't and, contribute and to my gold and rulership kind of thing. Yeah. I, I just uh, want to... Um... Uh, uh, just, just a few seconds. Uh, okay. uh, Marie-Louise von Franz wrote a, a brilliant essay about uh, the, the dreams of Descartes, three dreams of Descartes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then she realized, oh, <laughs> uh, um, by these dreams, she, she made an, uh, an analysis. She developed a lecture in the 50s at C.J. Jung Institute in Zurich. Uh, um, we, I think that we should, uh, 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 I say, I would like to say that um, kindly, uh, that we should rescue this lecture of Von Franz about the country. It will be very good for us. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you, Joel. Rescue this lecture about what? Uh, the lecture three dreams. Von France gave, Marie-Louise von France mm -hmm. gave at the C.G. Jung Institute in Zurich uh, in the middle 50s about uh, the dreams of uh, Henry Descartes. I think it's, it will be it will be very uh, uh, enriching. I don't know if I am using. Uh, I'm the sorry, I still me. can't understand the name. Uh, the dreams of who? Andre Descartes. H e n r i. Andre Descartes. So Descartes. Yeah, oh, Descartes. Yes. Dreams yeah. of yes. Descartes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Andre. Right. Henry. I'm sorry, I'm slow to pick it pick it up. Enjoyment. Oh, no. my hearing, my hearing isn't what it used to be. Okay, I want to refer everybody now, uh, and I very rarely plug uh, one of my books, but <clears throat> I want to refer everybody to my book, Tsunami of Blood. Um, and I put the the link on the YouTube chat where you can read some excerpts of it, and I'll put it here as well. Um, and uh, the interesting thing to me, or one of the interesting aspects of this, which was, uh, I wrote this book in 2007, which was some time after or before 
I fully grokked Jungian psychology. Okay, I, I would love to read it. And and uh, you can certainly see the those excerpts. It's available on Kindle, and um, and it's available to certain of my followers where who know where to look <laughs> and uh, in electronic form. But in any case, um, uh, what I wanted to mention about it and that and it is this. Debbie and I, throughout our marriage, have never been churchgoers per se. Uh, we have we go to church occasionally, uh, mostly on Christmas or Easter. Um, we're typical Christian Palm Sunday Easter Christians, I guess. But we go when when it's meaningful to our family. Um, and so when I wrote this book, uh, Debbie said to me, I was surprised to find out, find how many times you refer to God in this book. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just said, yeah, <laughs> what can I say, you know, because I, I don't, you know, I don't go to Christian services very frequently. For example, we have the Cathedral of the Navy within two miles of me here at the Naval Academy and um, the Naval Academy Chapel. And I, I occasionally have gone to services there, but I find myself getting really mad at the fundamentalists that have taken over the chaplain's corps of the <laughs> Navy. Uh, <laughs> and so I... And much more mm -hmm. uplifted by the chapel when I go there by myself. Um, it's interesting you string that up because we'll see this later in paragraph 567. But I, when I hear people talk about antinomy, N O M Y, which is the antinomy, yeah, antinomy is different than antimony, M O N Y, which is a brittle, silvery white, metallic. I think, you know, periodic table number 51 or there around somewhere. Right. But it's a difference between brittle and dynamic because antimony, the metalloid, is brittle, but antimony is dynamic. And I think we'll see that in this paragraph. But the one's an asset, I'd say, and antimony, the metalloid, would be logos, convincing, yeah. brittle, solid. And then antimony is going to be dynamic. And that's harder to pin down, though it is a creative asset. Right. So a couple of other comments here on uh, YouTube, and then we'll move on. Anders says, Stephen Pinker has dropped, done research showing that violence has been a, in steady decline throughout all of human history. And uh, then Zen Mode says, Stephen Pinker is fantastic. We are so blessed to be alive in this day and age. History has been brutal. Yeah, you think. <laughs> so, all right, reading uh, paragraph uh, 567, I'm going to ask uh, Jordan to read it and, and uh, begin the discussion while I take a short break. Certainly. Paragraph 567. These words clearly show that Job, in spite of his doubt, as to whether man can be just before God, still finds it difficult to relinquish the idea of meeting God on the basis of justice and therefore of morality. Because in spite of everything, he cannot give up his faith in divine justice. It is not easy for him to accept the knowledge that divine arbitrariness breaks the law. On the other hand, he has to admit that no one except Yahweh himself is doing him injustice and violence. He cannot deny that he is up against a God who does not care a rap for any moral opinion and does not recognize any form of ethics as binding. This is perhaps the greatest thing about Job, that faced with this difficulty, he does not doubt the unity of God. He clearly sees that God is at odds with himself so totally at odds that he, Job, is quite certain of finding in God a helper and a quote-unquote advocate against God. 
as certain as he is of the evil in Yahweh, he is equal cert, equally certain of the good. In a human being who renders us evil, we cannot expect at the same time to find a helper. But Yahweh is not a human being. He is both a persecutor and a helper in one, and the one aspect is as real as the other. Yahweh is not split, but is an anten antimony or antinomy, a quality of inner opposites. And this is the indispensable condition for his tremendous dynamism, his omniscience and omnipotence. Because of this knowledge, Job holds on to his attention, his intention of, quote unquote, defending his ways to his face, i.e., making his point of view clear to him, since notwithstanding his wrath, Yahweh is also man's advocate against himself when man puts forth his complaint. Thoughts, Joel? Opa. Uh, uh, the antinomia. Antinomy. Uh, the when we are talking about an antinomy, antinomy, we are talking about uh, as a, a, a psychological phenomenon. Phenomenon. Uh, we are talking about a pair of opposites where the the thesis ha, it's not a preponderant over the antithesis and, but there is a claim for conscience and uh, I think that the pair of opposites we here we have here is the human and the divine. That what that what came to me mm. now in that dynamic yeah, relationship. Let, yeah, let me uh, refer back now to our earlier discussion about authoritarians and specifically. Um, how we know that um, how we know that uh, Donald Trump is immature and not Yahweh. <laughs> <laughs> and we know yeah, that right. simply uh, we know that simply because um, of this antinomy. Um, a a six-year-old will want everything for himself all all the time and not care what your morals are and the same is true of donald trump but yahweh had antinomy in other words yahweh had inner opposites so he had a good side and a bad side this is what joe job recognized and so job made his appeal to the good side of God, the, the advocate side of God that would understand uh, Joel's predicament, even in the face of the evil side of God, because uh, the uh -huh. evil side of God was the side of God that made the bet with the devil, <laughs> right? After all. <laughs> it, it, well, that's it, a great point about a six-year-old, because I remember a friend of mine going, yeah, well, you know, they, they can come with me to the grocery store. And I said, you're not comfortable enough in your own skin to take a six-year-old to the grocery store. And he said, well, what, what, what do you mean? And this is that amoral, not morals, not immoral. I said, because you're going to be in the line and you're going to be embarrassed when little Bobby goes, drops his pants and says, I have a penis because he's not saying anything sexual. He's basically saying, I have fingers. I have a foot. He's just become aware of this thing. And I said, you're going to get all blush faced, red, embarrassed. And that's how you know he's six. 
It's like you can take them yeah. to the grocery store when there's seven, but right now you need to get over your own six. And it's interesting because that to me is that amoral, the six-year-old yeah. deity. So, so the point is uh, that in this middle uh, sentence here, Job is quite certain of finding in God a helper and an advocate against God. So um, whereas Donald Trump, I never heard him say anything that indicated a conscience or uh, anything except what was good for Donald Trump. Um, right. And, uh, but Yahweh, even Yahweh in the time between um, between Moses and Christ, even that Yahweh uh, was recognized to have an antinomy. Have you know, that's time. a wonderful point, um, attributing that to Trump, because after the whole, you know, classified documents at Mar-a-Lago in their files and classified documents ripped up and flushed down the toilet, it, it, it was utter nonsense when he was speaking and he started talking about people having to flush their toilet 10, 11, 12 yeah. times, not me, 10, 11, right in the middle of this is peppered the confession, not me, which is surely the child saying, no, I didn't hit the ball through Johnny's dad's window. And your dad looks at you and goes, why did you bring that up? Should we go talk to Mr. Anderson? Because I think you hit the ball through his window. Oh, <laughs> because there's like, oh, you know, you're not even queried. There's not even any guilt. You're confessing the truth because because, you know, it you think everyone else knows it. And there's a conscious lack of developed boundaries there. I mean, the six year old can't be an attorney because they have to tell the truth instead of cherry picking the facts for the structure they need to present. I mean, it's. Right. Um, so right, he's and, in that toilet paper thing, 10, 11, 12, not me, 13 times. People do this, not me. And then when he actually confesses right in the middle, not me, he's literally saying, I did this. I have no facts other than because of my own experience, because I don't care about anybody else, is what he's saying. Right, right, right. Okay, so the, uh, Joel. The, the I and the not I. Yes. Yes, very it well. It was but. not me. It was another eye. <laughs> yeah, it was another yeah. eye. Right, exactly. That, that, yeah. Which is, that, that complicates the whole plea of insanity, you know, legally, um, as to how to qualify the eye, not I, some other form of adjectival I within you. I mean. Yeah. Andrew Anders makes an amusing comment. He says, interesting example about the six-year-old. I think sexuality was necessarily has necessarily been severely suppressed in human civilization, or else we would still be living in nature, eating fruit and having sex all day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, who invented this work thing? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, there are Dionysian we, pleasures to enjoy. This work is getting in right. the way of that. <laughs> That's a really okay. Uh, All right, Joel. Um, do you wish to be a reader, or shall we do the reading and you just comment? It's your call. I mean, do you do you have answer to Job in front of you? And uh, well, uh, uh, there there's a, a problem. Uh, Portuguese. For, you have it in Portuguese. I, I hear, uh, yes, yes, I, I, I am following, uh, why, while you are reading in English, I am following here in Portuguese, mm, uh, but uh, um, the OC number seven is on the way by Amazon.com. <laughs> Okay. All so, right. Sean, well, you um, thank you very you, much. You know, thank so you we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll relieve, I'll relieve you of that. Very sensitive. I'll relieve you of that duty then so that you don't have to be stressed. So let me read um, 568. This is paragraph 568 of Answer okay. Job. And let's 
remind everyone that when we have a big number like 568, it doesn't mean that we're, we've already read 568 paragraphs that you've missed. These numbers are references to the numbers used in volume 11 of the collected works of C.G. Young, where Answer to Job is a small part of it. And so this is actually only about the 10th or 12th actual paragraph of the book. I mean, this is mm. what our third and or fourth week right. in Answer to Job. So, so you've only, if you are joining us right now, you've only missed the first uh, two or three sessions. You haven't missed a uh, hundred sessions. Okay, going on. Paragraph 568. One would be even more astonished at Job's knowledge of God if this were the first time when we're hearing of Yahweh's amorality, his incalculable moods and devastating attacks of wrath had, however, been known from time immemorial. He had proved himself to be a jealous defender of morality and was specially sensitive in regard to justice. Hence, he had always to be praised as just, which it seemed was very important to him. Thanks to this circumstance of peculiarity of his, he had a distinct personality. Okay, he had a distinct personality, which differed from that of a more or less archaic king, only in scope. Okay. Uh, his jealous and irritable nature, uh, prying mistrustfully uh, into the faithless hearts of men and exploring their secret thoughts compelled a personal relationship between himself and man who could not help but feel personally called by him. That was the essential difference between Yahweh and the all-ruling father Zeus, who, or Zeus, we usually pronounce it, father Zeus, uh, who in a benevolent and somewhat detached manner allowed the economy of the universe to roll along on its accustomed courses and punished only those who were disorderly. He did not moralize, but ruled purely instinctively. He did not demand anything from uh, more. He did not demand anything more from human beings than the sacrifices due to him. He did not want to do anything with human beings because he had no plans for them. Father Zeus is certainly a figure, but not a personality. Yahweh, on the other hand, was interested in man. Human beings were a matter of first grade importance to him. He needed them as he needed, uh, they needed him urgently and personally. Zeus could uh, too, could throw thunderbolts about, but only at hopelessly disorderly individuals. Against mankind as a whole, he had no objections, but then they did not interest him at him all that much. <laughs> 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 Yahweh, however, could not could get inordin inordinately ex excited about man as a species and men as individuals if they did not behave as he desired and expected, without ever considering that in his omnipotence he could easily have created something better than these bad earthenware pots. Unquote. <laughs> That's <laughs> okay. Uh, well, that's the, the bad earthenware pots, you know, the allusion A L L U S I O N, allusion to the sacred clay Adam and Eve were, you know, made from these bad earthenware pots, which is it's interesting. Then that's you know, the allu allusion to us as humans being the vessel of bad earthenware, you know, I mean, yeah. we're, too, we're just a bad pot should be cast yeah. off the mountain to crack i mean or or as it was uh as one of the alien creatures on star trek next generation called us ugly bags of mostly water yeah 
<laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because this, this, it's funny because my dad was a biblical scholar as well as poet and professor, but this whole, this right here, this point of his jealous and irritable nature, prying mistrustfully into the faithless hearts of men and exploring their secret thoughts. Well, what's interesting about that, I remember asking, I think my dad, I think it was, um, what, what? why are you always watching me? What, what? He goes, I'm not watching you. You tell me everything I need to know. I don't pry mistrustfully. That's none of my business. That's yours. But I love this point, you know, prying mistrustfully into the faithless hearts of men. That's a childish parent right there. Mm-hmm. You know, that's not someone with authority here. So Job is really into right here, starting to get this, the jealous and irritable nature. You, you know, you just said, I mean, you started laughing with, you know, not terribly concerned about these bad earthenware pots. Yeah. yeah. Well, and also uh, in commenting to some of the things that are happening on YouTube here, um, you know, this is what we, uh, what is happening to us as we as we're coming to consciousness to the fifth mm-hmm. stage of consciousness is that we're understanding uh, psychology better and better and the and the first phase of understanding that was understanding this the six year old that's in all of us right um, and that's pointing back to Freudian theory but now we're coming into the age where Jungian theory. Uh, is being accepted more and more. I mean, I've, I've really seen that in spades over the last 20 years, uh, especially since 2005 when I started to follow um, Carl Jung Depth Psychology page on Facebook, which is operated by Louis LaFontaine. And mm-hmm. that is just a terrific asset if you, if you want to start to get into Jung, uh, go to that Facebook page and see what's happened. But when I joined that page in 2005, uh, Lewis had about um, 4,000 followers. The last time I looked, which was some months ago, he had over 86,000, if I recall, Mm -hmm. somewhere between 82 and 86,000. And so that just shows that the time of Jung is coming. And, you know, even I'm seeing a very successful spinoffs from what I'm doing um, coming out in, in various languages, uh, including in English. Uh, Craig Nelson is, wonder- is running a wonderful mm-hmm. one on, on dreams. Um, and I have intentionally avoided dreams only because uh, I'm an attorney and I I want to avoid any appearance that I am an analyst. I am not a licensed analyst and I've Mm -hmm. never made such claims and nor does Craig make such claims. But I think that when we get into interpreting people's dreams other than our own, I, I, I feel I have license to interpret my own dreams, but uh, if I try to interpret somebody else's dream on a chat like this, I feel I'm treading upon the toes of uh, the mental health community. So that's why I don't do it. Um, But well, I have the same perspective as a former architect. You know, my ENO back then, Arizona Emissions Insurance. The million dollar umbrella wasn't a cover. If I made legal decisions or real estate decisions, I was going to put myself in trouble. So I get your, you yeah. know, don't make psychological decisions, not being a psychologist. So, um, yeah. so I mean, I get that the liability piece of yeah. taking care not and, to have someone follow your advice unduly. I mean, it's on them whether they do or they don't act upon what they've experienced right. and, here. And I, I'm, I've always simply been interpreting young from my perspective and what what my perspective has always been is that it's helped me okay ever since um when i first picked up uh, man and his symbols in 1990 off the bookshop off a 
a bookstore shelf. Um, I, uh, I read that book uh, cover to cover to my wife as we were going to, to sleep for a year. Okay, I read three to four pages every night to my wife before we went to sleep. And it took us about a year to get through it. But, but when we got to the end of that year, we both felt that we had had a year's psychotherapy. Uh, somehow it, it had influenced us as a psychotherapist would. Um, that's a really good anecdotal story because that's to me, my friends who are professional psychiatrists, psychologists that I'm close with. Um, one of the pieces is they said, you know, honestly, it's, it's more about how I help you guide yourself than it is what I tell you. And every once in a while, I'll ask you a question to see how you course correct, not to course correct you. So what's right. interesting, even in the liability piece, they're not telling people what to do either. They're, they're in a sense, they're front seat, back seat driving while right. you're behind the steering wheel. And so the liability piece is a little more gray, I find, think, psychologically, because we're, we all have a degree in living life by a certain point. Right. But not telling yeah, other people so what to do. That's right. And so, so it's always been my purpose to make the information available to people. And, um, you know, and this is where I'm going to just plug the confluence again for a moment, because I want to people to understand what insight that we finally had as a group of organizers after our meeting in November, when we were together in California, and we're going to do it again in two weeks time. Um, so there won't be a class, this class, two weeks from today, because I'll be in California again. But um, but. What I want to emphasize is that we we have recently found uh, through the good offices of Lawrence Jaffe and his book, Liberating the Heart, on page 41, he gives the one sentence, a single sentence that sums up um, the essence of Jungian psychology but it also sums up the essence of all the world's religions. And it also sums up the essence of the importance of our, which we have in our rationalistic world swept aside and we have to wake up to that. Right. And so let me just, uh, let me just read the sentence. Uh, and then I want to uh, explain this a little further. So, Here's what Jaffe says. The purpose of Jung's whole psychology is to make accessible to us that healing power which resides in our unconscious. Okay. The purpose of Jung's whole psychology is to make accessible to us that healing power which resides in our unconscious. Now, what we realize because um, of a variety of things. One that Jung had observed, and I'll pull up the meme shortly, but Jung had observed that psychology and um, the world's religions are in the same business, okay? Without really uh, essentializing it as Jaffe did. But he had observed that, and that's in um, volume 10 of the collected works, and I'll pull up the meme in a minute. So we were already talking about psychology and religion being in the same business, but um, the piece that came together for me uh, was specifically with um, my two artist friends, Tim Holmes and Pauline Kiber. Um, and Pauline's having a, a major surgery um, this Wednesday, and so please, everyone, keep her in your in your thoughts. But um, but Colleen, um, t- 
first of all, it came because Tim was the son of uh, generations of uh, pastors, the same as Jung. And Tim got onto the, the Jung gravy train about the same time I did. And so we initially connected because of that primarily. Uh, and the fact that I, I simply loved Tim's art. Uh, he's a sculptor, and uh, I'll put his website on the chat in a moment. But um, you know, I had a traumatic experience, which was about a year ago. I was um, diagnosed with prostate cancer, and the very first thing that came to my mind was that I should. Um, have Tim paint my portrait as a legacy. That's the very first thing that came to my mind when I got that diagnosis. And I've since had a radiation treatment for that. So I think it's under control, I hope. But in any case, um, I went out to Tim's studio on May, I spent the day of May 7th, 2021 with Tim. And um, it was an incredibly numinous experience. I slept uh, in his studio two nights and uh, wow, the, the ghosts of Christmas past were <laughs> definitely in that place. Uh, and you know, the spirits were zinging around my head and at that time. And so I left very early in the morning of the 8th and I wasn't sure what had just happened to me, but I realized that there was something to it. So I conned him into doing this, this confluence. And uh, I said, and we have to bring Colleen into it. Now, the reason I felt Colleen was important was that through certain techniques that Colleen has used throughout her career, as an artist, uh, she puts you in touch with your unconscious. Okay, so mm -hmm. the exact same thing, and which is, uh, you know, so one could say the purpose of Colleen Kiber's whole art is to make uh, accessible to us that healing power which resides in our unconscious. If we just change Jaffe's sentence in that much in that way then we say see what the power of art is and how it mm -hmm. can make accessible our unconscious and um, so I've actually taken up calligraphy because I've found it's a tremendous uh, meditation technique which does put me in touch with my unconscious and the point the point here is that our unconscious heals us. Terrible things happen to all human beings throughout life. We lose a brother or a sister. Um, we lose a child. Everybody loses parents. And all those things are traumatic. And, um, and it's the healing power of the, of the unconscious, which carries us through in those crisis times. And, um, and so we've now observed, at least in, in, uh, in essence, that religion, art, and psychology are all of the same thing. And so what we, and so when we were together, uh, with our other colleagues, uh, John Jackson and Sherry uh, Loveler um, in November was that, wow, the energy that developed among the six of us over that weekend was just amazing. And we all came out of it uh, having been uh, very much validated and, and feeling very strong and happy and almost in a kind of euphoria 
after we had been together for this two days, especially. Um, it was actually uh, four days, but it was two days when all six of us were together. And, uh, and Bob Manis also, when we came out of it, we realized, oh, that's the confluence. That's the connection. It isn't only the connection between Jung, uh, between psychology and religion. It's the connection of all three of them, and they all do the same thing. They all um, bring us closer to the unconscious and make it accessible to us. And this is the turnaround that, that Edinger effectuates when he says very simply, consider the Lord's Prayer as seven petitions to your unconscious. Instead of it being mm -hmm. seven, uh, seven prayers or whatever to this God out there, this agency out there that you can't see, consider it as seven petitions to your unconscious. If you do that, then you turn everything around and it brings you um, to your unconscious. And so I don't remember exactly what he said about all the seven petitions, but let's, let's take it line by line for a moment to the extent I remember it correctly. Uh, and who so, had said uh, that again? Edward Edinger. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, so, okay. so it's seven petitions to your unconscious. So our father, okay, you know, that which created us, um, which art in heaven. Um, and so instead of saying that heaven is out there, heaven is here or heaven is in the psyche. Hallowed be thy name. And what we're saying is that, that this, this entity that we call God uh, has been considered sacred throughout history by all of the world's religions. And so we're making an appeal to that sacred thing. Um, so hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. In other words, um, we want what, what God wanted in heaven um, we want, all of us, we want that. And so uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so it, it means that we are trying to uh, manifest heaven on earth, which is exactly what Christ said, but it was, it was suppressed, but it definitely is what Christ said, which is heaven is spread upon the earth and men do not see it. Okay, that's what Christ said. And so the point is we're trying to manifest heaven on earth. Um, and uh, so on earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Well, somehow all the creatures of the world do eat, okay? They may be poor and, and be starving, but you don't live with, very long without eating anything. And so if there's 8, 8 billion people on the planet, um, somehow they get their daily bread. Okay? And that ability to get their daily bread comes from the unconscious. Okay, it, it manifests in millions of different ways, of course, both rich and poor, but somehow they all eat, somehow. Uh, and so uh, give us and also, our daily bread. Go ahead. Say also, Edinger, with the, the healing power of the psyche, there's the everyone eats, so to speak. So there's that piece of the self nourishment with the bread there, too. Right. That right, okay. So that's the the philosophical bread, okay. And, right, and literally, Jung found this out when this old lady came to his door one day and um, knocked on his door and 
asked him if, um, you know, just said, I just wanted to meet you one time. And this was a poor lady. Uh, and he's, and she wasn't, uh, you know, she wasn't a thoughtful person, not an educated person. Okay. Um, she said, um, he said, well, why do you, why did you want to come and meet me? And she said, well, your words are like bread to me. Okay. Which is mm. exactly your point. Yeah. And, and when he heard that, that changed him and his perspective of it, because what he was saying was that it was like bread. Uh, and so give us our daily bread. Uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, depending on which <laughs> words you follow. Um, you know, forgive us. In other words, we have done wrong to somebody. Okay, we've all done wrong to somebody. And we want to be forgiven for that. And we want to forgive others who have done wrong to us. So, um, so and that's the Jesus saying, you know, he who is without sin may cast the first stone. Yeah, and and so we want to be forgiven by our own psyche because if our own psyche and our own unconscious isn't forgiving us, then it's going to cause an accident or do something that's not right and or that's mm -hmm. that you would consider not right but it's going to cause you to to make a mistake or to inflame somebody that you shouldn't inflame and you end up dead <laughs> uh, yeah and well and i think right along that point too i mean as colleen colleen kiebert says um from lilith directly almost so many apples so few takers and right. with discussions we've had on Wednesday, you know, Lilith basically making the first conscious choice to utter the ineffable. She's in a sense irascible, and, but she's, she's also conscious. There's a seed of inception of consciousness there. And then when she sneaks back into the garden as the serpent and seduces Eve for the apple to be bitten, then that's the birth of consciousness. And so I, I right. think as, as an you know, as a blessing out to Colleen, I'd say with this, you know, so many apples, so few takers, except right. with a gift in them in by UPS, there's one more taker. So yeah. this is one of one of so, Colleen's apples. So yes. So, um, and and so that's uh, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Right. Right. And when you and, shake it, there's something inside. There's something yeah. rattling around in there. So, you know, there's a little right. psyche going on in her apples, which is, I think, really, yeah. really cool. And, and just in case anybody has a, a rumor going around because the red on my hand here that I'm somehow Satan, uh, actually, no, it's just, my, it's just my calligraphy getting away from me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and because, because I'm using dip pens, I often get... Yeah, that ink on my fingers <laughs> so, so let, let's squash that rumor right from, from the beginning because i'm realizing my video is picking up this red on my fingers and it's because yeah I, skip I, is not I, confessing subtly that his <laughs> yeah, right to a different role okay so did i get to the end of it uh for that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever so the the point is that mm -hmm. The unconscious is all powerful, okay? Right. Both the individual unconscious and the collective unconscious. And our unconscious makes our being possible. Uh, it, it works every day. It replaces all the cells in our body. So every seven years, all the cells in our body are replaced every seven years. Now that is a hell of a concept that mm -hmm. your con your unconscious is taking care of that for you every minute of every day of your life and uh you unless i speak of it you're never thinking about your heartbeat 
or your breathing. Mm -hmm. Okay, only if you're having a problem with your heart or your lungs do you really think about it, or you have to go to the cardiologist as as Colinas had to do. Um, but you know, it's Colleen's consciousness that's going to keep her alive during that uh, mm -hmm. surgery that she's going to have. And it's, it's the unconscious that's going to have her recover afterward. And mm -hmm. that is a profoundly powerful um, concept. And so uh, to not understand that as God, um, good luck with that, you know. Um, and so well, that reminds me of the discussion with the, one of the images in um, the anatomy of the psyche that we are doing on Wednesdays, where anytime you see an image and then something is reaching up to penetrate the firmament, then with Edinger's piece here is the Lord's Prayer, seven petitions to your unconscious. That's then a painting or an etching or an engraving of an inner view. That is your psyche incarnate and the piercing the firmament is reaching out to connect with others um, and also connecting with the unseen. Right. And so um, let's say 30 years from now, I suspect that this video will still be available on YouTube, even though, <laughs> even though, uh, I'm not likely to be still breathing at that point. If I if I'm 105, well, God bless me. But <laughs> but but the point is that uh, Joel's spirit and Jordan's spirit and my spirit uh, can be conveyed to you, uh, the viewers mm -hmm. of this video, um, through this electronic means and. You know, that's in a sense, that's immortality. That's not, you know, mm -hmm. that, that means that what we're, what we do is not no longer balanced, bounded by the lifespan of a human being. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, well, that makes an argument to that, pick your wisdom wisely because at that point, everything will be at the age of Yoda eventually. And um, at that point, you probably wanted to have, as that woman did, I wanted to meet you once, Ms. Dr. Young, because your words are like bread. But, you know, make sure you pick the right bread. You know, Make sure you pick the right nourishment because garbage in, garbage out. Well, that's right. And, and you know, we, if we don't live our lives properly, then after our death, we don't live in heaven, we live in hell. And, and that hell, uh, that, that immortality um, is being carried on in our uh, children and our children's children on down the generations uh, in waves. And, uh, and so, if, if you're going to be remembered in heaven, it's only because um, you're taking action in your physical life. Um, and if you're, if you're waiting for something magical to happen, uh, that, that you get to the pearly gates and, and uh, the archangel lets you in, uh, good luck with that. You know, uh, you, you can't, being forgiven of your sins might be that you're, if you're a really sinful person, it might be that you're forgotten, right? <laughs> uh, and, yes. um, and so, you know, that's, that's the point. Okay. Well, yeah, uh, forgotten, a, forgotten there makes an allusion to, you know, the owning what you've done right and wrong and just yeah. simply with sovereignty and personal responsibility you just simply are unthreatened and well yes i did that for that i'm sorry and but not just saying the words there's a feeling of of living with blessing and apology both in terms of how to interact and be conscious of others and um 
it's kind of reminds me of, you know, Pat Benatar's song, you know, hell is for children. It's a song about emotional abuse and sexual abuse, but um, they, you are forgotten. But the child has not yet done something legacy level except live. But the part, thing is learning how to live naturally that way lifelong that becomes legacy level. And I, I really appreciate your comment of, you know, maybe hell is not being forgiven for your sins, but being forgotten because you didn't own them. Yeah. Or being remembered for terrible things that you've done. Right. Um, you know, that's a kind of hell also. Yeah. Um, all right. So I, we're after 11 oh, o'clock. Wow. We've been going for two hours. So I guess I'll call a halt here. Uh, Joel, do you have any final thoughts about anything that we've talked about today? Oh, yes. Uh, um, two thoughts. Uh, in 2016, uh, I made a uh, um, I'm sorry, can you sit sit closer to your mic or something? Because we okay. really can't hear you well. Uh, are you here? Uh, yeah, you actually, your mic okay. is, is this that, thing on your... Yes, yes, yes. This thing here. Okay, okay. right. Uh, you we don't hear you. Better now? No, that's worse. Oh, my. That's worse. <laughs> You started with 2016, I think. It was hard to hear, it was, but. Yeah. Uh, that's better. That's better. Okay, that's better, that's better. Yeah. Well, uh, 2016, I made the, 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 I wrote a few pages about the, the, but it was a self-reflection about the, the uh, presidential running between uh, uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, Donald Trump. And what came to me was that uh, uh, um, the, the two pair of opposites, uh, the rational personified in Hillary and the rational personified in Trump. And I realized that the, with the irrational pair, there is no possibility of dialogue. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, um, the, the, the work to be done is uh, uh, how can we uh, uh, to, could sensibilize it the, or, or, uh, uh, the rational pair of opposites to, uh, to, to have some type of dialogue. Uh, uh, and so uh, this this came to me. Uh, Hillary as the 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 rational pair, uh, rational fold, and uh, rational is uh, uh, as an opposite, and the other opposite, the rational. And I think that maybe now we have Joe Biden and we have a woman in the vice in the VP vice presidency in, as Kamala Harris. And the other thing that came to me it was about uh, self forgiveness. Um, I uh, uh, my my work at the in the justice at the court is to listen in audience uh, uh, children and teenagers victims of uh, sexual abuse uh, they not um, 
stand before the judge. There is, uh, uh, I talk with them in, in a room, in a consulting room, uh, mm -hmm. appropriate, and the judge watch me in real time uh, in internet. And uh, one teenager, a female teenager, uh, said to me, I am feeling myself dirty. And uh, I, I said to her, you must forgive yourself. And she, uh, I must, for and she told me that I must forgive myself of what? Uh, of what you did not uh, ha uh, could had the, the force, the strength to stop this. And a uh, few weeks later, uh, uh, she came and she told me, I'm uh, Joel, uh, thank you very much, uh, thanks for what? And she said, now I'm, I am feeling clean. Well, oh my, mm. uh, did you, you forgave yourself? And she smiled back to me and said, yes. That's wonderful wisdom, yeah. Joel, because the forgiving yourself for that which you did not do, because people will take personal responsibility for things that have been done to them, just like a child would take responsibility for a parent's divorce or a parent's leaving or a parent's you know, life or death um, because they are attached. So they have a, an, a weird form of empathy. And especially, as you said, in that abuse case, she forgave herself for that which she did not do, which to me, that's a wonderful way to go further than it's not your fault to forgive yourself for that which you did not do so you can release yourself from the attachment. That's, yeah. That was wonderfully wise. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. One, one of the wonderful things about my children, which I realize in retrospect, of course, is that um, I actually left their mother because of something my daughter had said uh, one time her mother and I were in a, in a typical shouting match and um, and I don't know I mean my ex-wife knew all my buttons and knew how to push all my buttons and and every time we had the least argument or the least dispute about any topic she would go back and go through all, all my buttons. So she would escalate the argument interminably. And finally, uh, we had, a, we had a, a spiral staircase in our kitchen going up to the children's bedroom. And uh, a, coming down on a string was a note uh, to us that was coming down the middle of the spiral staircase. And here was this note. And the note said, please stop fighting. And in that moment, I realized that we could not, that it would not, we would not be able to do it. And that's when I realized that that marriage was over. And um, because uh, you know, we, we probably could have benefited by th therapy. We could have benefited by being better educated about psychology and what happens in a marriage, but we were not. And that's been a lifelong regret of mine that, that we did not have better education uh, in our lifetimes. <clears throat> but I was very careful when separating from them to say, to speak to all the girls in a very loving way and tell them that 
that I still love them and I still love their mother uh, and I still love their mother, but I love her as a sister, not as a, as a spouse anymore. And I could no longer continue to live with her and, and, you know, do what I felt was necessary in the parenting of my daughters, um, which was to stop fighting. We had to stop fighting and I couldn't do it. And we didn't have, a, we didn't have therapists, we didn't have enough education on psychology. And so I didn't have an off ramp and neither did my uh, ex-wife. And I realized that in that moment when I saw that note. And, um, and so we separated and, but one of the things that has phenomena that have occurred, and I urge this on everyone because most marriages break up badly, is that I emphasized my love for my daughters. And I made over the next 10 years, I made about 10, uh, 200, about 200, 400 mile trips um, to visit with them. I would spend a week and a month if I could um, with my daughters. And uh, the result of that, um, now, uh, let's see how many years later, it's 40 years later now, that, um, that my daughters interact with me uh, the same as they would, in my opinion, the same as they would if I had stayed in the home. Uh, and uh, I often run into my ex-wife because she's the, the mother of the same three daughters. And so she's often present at holidays and family events. And, um, you know, I, I know that I still love her, but I love her like a sister. And so she and her husband and I and my new wife, Debbie, who's been with me for 37 years now, um, we... Um, can go out to dinner together with, without recrimination. And um, so we all grew up and, but, but not everybody is capable of that, unfortunately. And so I would urge everybody that's listening to this, if they have a, a problem with their marriage to, to definitely see a therapist early and learn as much as you can about psychology so that you can understand how you can repair hurts that uh, are otherwise irreparable. And um, the, the solution that, that I came up with, with Debbie, and I don't know if this is what a therapist would recommend, but this is what Debbie and I do is that we made a pact at the beginning that if we ever had an argument about anything, we would never speak of it again. In other words, if we then later had another argument, um, we couldn't bring up the previous argument in the new argument, that we would never speak of a previous, uh, previous uh, dispute between us. And, you know, that's what had destroyed my marriage, that every time we had a dispute on anything like the water's too hot or the water's too cold, for example, uh, then everything from the beginning would be brought up again. And it was like, uh, it was like a drip on porcelain. You know, if you keep dripping on it, eventually it'll wear through the porcelain. And so... Uh, you know, that's what happened to me. I finally got to the point where I couldn't count with it anymore and I had to leave. But, um, but my recommendation, my personal recommendation, and this is not a psychological recommendation, is that, that if you ever have an argument with your spouse, you make that, when you resolve it, 
you never speak of it again and never make it a, a subject for discussion about, oh, you were wrong back then type thing. Uh, because if you do that, then you just build it up, build it up, build it up until it's too much. And uh, that's- You know, I, what I appreciate most, I think about the whole of that story is out of the mouths of babes comes the stop fight, please stop fighting. Please and stop fighting. Mo yep. most arguments aren't because of the argument, they're because of unresolved trauma that each person triggers in the other and then blames the other for when they're right. separate. But your version, your and Debbie's version of put a fence around the argument, because what happens there, you may not resolve that trauma by, by ignoring it, but you do stop the displacement of traumas taking new faces and getting internal allies in your own civil war that then are yeah. taken out on your partner. And so little by little, you start to get a wisdom from knowing how to navigate the rocks in the river rather than making the rocks all erode, you know, to where it's a smooth sailing thing. So to me, I, I, I mean, I'm no psychologist, but that's certainly a method where it may not stop an internal civil war, but it certainly silences that trauma from that voice. So there's, I, I, I see, even in my own work, I see some people are better at navigating around the rocks in the river. And some people are better at, let me dissolve this rock so that it, I have more river. And Neither one is right or wrong. It feels like a personality piece as to the resonance of, you know, I, I may go headlong running towards the bullets. Well, that's not what everyone's going to do. And that, that doesn't mean it's because it's right for me. It's right for anybody else. So I appreciate that, you know, in that moment, please stop fighting. You have the epiphany of, oh, we can't. And you didn't say yeah. she can't, you didn't say I can't, you said we can't, and then that's the last we, then it becomes sibling, sister, because you realize that you can't stop triggering each other within and then throwing those incendiaries on each other. I mean, that that's a wise yeah. moment right there that I can't kind of thing. And Amelia says on YouTube, uh, that's life. I have the same experience. My marriage had an expiration date. Um, <laughs> and so, so let's, let's, Joel, That's, Joel is a psychotherapist in Brazil. Yeah. So Joel, let's give you the last uh, say on yeah. this. And then I want to share this meme that I promised earlier. Well, uh, love makes the transcendent function. Mm. Yeah, that's a very profound. Love makes the tr transcendent function. That's really good. That, that's it, beautiful. Because it applies you within and to both. It, it activates. Wow. Uh, uh, the Jung, Jung wrote uh, in 1966 this text, and the tr uh, transcendent function. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to think as a mathematical function, but uh, uh, I realized that uh, law makes the transcendent function. Maybe is an uh, incognito. I, I don't know if uh, uh, of this equation, uh, but I I think that law uh, in a noble level of Evers and love for humanity, for humankind, and for each other makes the transcendent function. And the, the other thing that came to me, it's not so wise and not so noble, but talking about wives, uh, my wife is red, a red woman. And red woman are a little bit tempered, and she's sitting near me. And uh, I think that. Maybe she's remember me, remembering me that uh, lunch is ready. My luck is that she does not uh, understand English. <laughs> <laughs> so I would be dead by now. 
<laughs> and the, the, the group of Monday. Oh, oh, that's beautiful. We, we remember our good friend Joel. He was a good man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, I'm going to skip a few of these comments on YouTube. But <laughs> that's Mila, just beautiful. Uh, no, says, no, my, no. I would she love says, to. My ex had a. My ex had a path he wanted to take, and I had my own. We couldn't meet in the middle, maybe in the future. And uh, she says, uh, the best part of my marriage is my son. And uh, I guess children are the transcendent function also, uh, because they transcend those things. Um, and certainly they have transcended uh, everything that you know, all the ill will that was in my marriage at the end. Um, but, um, you know, that was basically it. My, we came back from Japan and my wife had a vision of us living in a town of 5,000 people and me practicing law for the rest of my life, which I had already established that I wasn't going to do because I'd left the practice of law five years earlier and I was not going to go back to it. And, but that was her vision. And my vision was to have an international career and uh, which I have done. And so I went one way and she stayed where she stayed, which was my hometown. It happened that we lived in my hometown at the time. So she accused us me of dropping her off in my hometown, <laughs> which, is a, which is a true statement. Oh, wow. <laughs> but, the bus, but the anyway, bus she, route ends here. <laughs> yeah, but, but she did, but she did, uh, uh, marry marry a, a second time with a, a lovely man who is also my friend now and and, uh, and I certainly appreciate their relationship because they both got what they wanted and needed and I got what I wanted and needed so mm -hmm. um, you know so that was a good thing <laughs> um, so I want to share this one uh, meme try to wrap this up now with my thought about our confluence. Um, so this is the meme um, and it is uh, uh, paragraph 367 of volume 10 of the collected works of C.G. Young. Theologian and the title and everything, um, the title is mine and the material in brackets is mine. Uh, and the, the point in red is the big point. But for thousands of years, the mind of man has, was worried about the sick soul, perhaps even earlier than it did about the sick body, the propitiation of gods, the perils of the soul and its salvation. These are not yesterday's problems. Religions are naturally evolved, those are my words, psychotherapeutic systems in the truest sense of the word and on the grandest scale. They express the whole range of the psychic problem in mighty images. They are the avowal and recognition of the soul and at the same time, the revelation of the soul's nature. So um, I've been referring to this uh, quote for years now, many years. It was part of my lecture and 2019 in finding the living God, but um, I, I, what I hadn't realized and the connection I had not made, and this relates to um, Jaffe's sentence, is that, um, that the same applies to art, okay? That art points us toward um, the problems of the soul and we must understand it and evolve from it. And so there's two kinds of art and unfortunately the rationalists among us are stuck on the, the old kind, which is um, that 
art should be able to replicate nature, that it is, uh, that if you're a painter, you should be, a, you know, replicate nature perfectly, that you are, um, that you're a camera, basically. And so in, a, in my adult education art classes that I took, I see in a, in a um, painting of a still life, I see everybody trying to create an exact replica of that still life as, and you know, the truth is we don't need people painting pictures of that still life anymore because we have cameras for that. We all have them in our pockets mm -hmm. and our smartphones. So we can replicate that still life any day of the week just by whipping out our smartphone and taking a picture. But, but there's something beyond that. And that is what Colleen Kiber cracked into. And that is what we found uh, after our meeting in November, that um, all of these things are pointing to the same thing. And that is Jaffe's um, quote, which is, and I'm gonna read it again. The purpose of Jung's whole psychology is to make accessible to us that healing power, which resides in our unconscious. Now, Colleen Kiber had a uh, very deep wound at one point uh, that needed healing. Her, uh, her son uh, died in 1995, and he was, um, well, I'm not going to say any more detail about that because that's story to tell, but um, the, the question uh, came whether she was uh, afforded justice by, um, by uh, authorities in Rome, Italy. <laughs> and um, she said she went into the Courthouse, and in there, there was a typical statue of justice um, with a sword in one hand and a, a scale, a measuring scale, a weighted scale in the other hand. And that is the archetypal image of what we find is justice. And um, her experiences suggested that that image was untrue, um, that she did not get justice from the authorities in Rome. And uh, she came back from her trip to Rome, having tried to find answers and get justice, totally unsatisfied because she, um, you know, she had seen that statue and she said, that's not true. And uh, so what she did was, um, and you know, fortunately she had the experience as an artist and as a Jungian also at that point in time to find what the answer was, find what the answer was. And so she uh, created a series of five sculptures, which <laughs> all of them are, about four feet tall, they're bronze. <clears throat> and she showed the development of the healing power of her own unconscious, healing her wound, <clears throat> which was a very uh, deep psychic wound that she had experienced with the death of her son. And uh, what she came ultimately to was uh, the feather of justice, which is um, that if you 
if you weigh everything and everything is equal, then a feather will show you the truth. And, and the, ba the balance uh, can be in the weight of a feather. And this is an act, idea actually that dates back to uh, Egyptian times. Uh, they were talking about uh, the weight of a feather in Egyptian times by, with the goddess Isis. And, uh, and then the less it's uh, what Colleen ultimately came to. And I think that this process in her took perhaps uh, a couple of years. Uh, these are very major sculptures that she did. And uh, she's a ceramic artist. So she did them in ceramic first and then, uh, then they were created in bronze also. Um, and, uh, and she came to her unconscious through a, an evolution that took five different pieces, five different ma major works of sculpture. But through doing that sculpture, she found the truth. Okay. And she found the feather of truth. And this is a, a very, very moving series of pieces of work that I think should be in every court and every law school in the, in the world uh, is, is Cohen's pieces. You know, in the same sense that we find the Burgers of Calais, there are six major versions of it. They're, you know, they're the same sculpture, but they were cast six times and they're around the world. Um, these, these bronzes of Colleen should be in every law school in the world to at every court so that lawyers can understand the difference between the kind of justice that's represented by the sword and the, and the balance and, um, and the kind of justice that uh, healed Colleen, uh, you know, that's a hurt. When you lose a child like that, it's a hurt that can't be re resolved in any way, but um, that resolution came to her through art and through her unconscious and through it gradually evolving through these five sculptures. And so the significance of that is that, that art too, in addition to religion and psychology, which Dr. Jung had pointed out, what Colleen has done for me is that she pointed it out that the same applies to art and that the fact that the rationalists have run art out of our schools is a horrible thing for younger generations and we need to get it back in but we need to get it back in um, among artists who know what I'm talking about right now about art being a a way of healing the soul. And um, you know, we talk about art sometimes as being soulful, soulful but uh, you know, we, we can only heal the soul. I mean, we had, this is within our agency that if we learn an art, we find that it can heal our soul. Um, and so the significance of the confluence that we're doing in June is that we are going to, through a series of events over a four day period, we, every single thing that we do will be thoughtfully related to making accessible that healing power, the healing power of the unconscious. And so we won't be giving lectures that would be logos that would be rationalism it's not about that it's about actually experiencing what we're talking about and uh, it will be from the point of view of religion 
and psychology and art showing them to be doing one and the same thing, which is um, Jaffe's sentence here. The whole purpose of Jung's psychology, of Jung's whole psychology, but I would say the purpose of art and the purpose of religion is to make accessible to us that healing power which resides in our unconscious. That is the fundamental thing that we have been able to grok, we six in our organizers group. And this is why uh, I know that the, what we are going to do in June is going to be extremely powerful. And I urge you to join us, to tell us you'd like to join us. And it is June 10th to 14th in Helena, Montana. And I'll put on the chat, to chat again, the link to it. Um, Jordan, do you have any comments? I, you know, I think you just rounded it right back up to what Joel said, because the terrible intensity of the just loss of the loss of a child, so overpowering. And Colleen's sculptures are a direct representation of love makes the transcendent love makes the transcendent function, as Joel said. And I yeah. think that whole story applies there because, um, I, I, you know, that's it's unimaginable to lose a child. I mean, yeah. It's it's even unnatural. It feels so that I think that rounds back up to I'll just say love makes the transcendent function. That that really landed Joel, and that that really I think also dances with um, what Colleen's teachings have been because she's shared with us, you know, the creative process and um, that it came out of something so poignant and terribly intense that it's an unimaginable that um, I just love makes a transcendent function and that really just comes right back around to you sharing the story as well of her loss. And so all of humanity has been living with these three disciplines in silos, art, psychology, and religion, separated in separate silos. But now we have to start talking about them as all part of the same thing. And, um, and that, that is a new insight that we're presenting. I'm, you know, I, I've, I've articulated it, but I can't take credit for it because it's something that we all experience together and we all realize in some way. And uh, so I think that they articulated it fairly comprehensively here, but, um, but you know, we, uh, but I can't claim credit for it. I, I can just say that, you know, this is something that we have to start thinking about and presenting to others. And um, it's, a, it's a confluence, which when we were together in November, we, f we found it applied to us. And we only found that in retrospect, okay, because it was something that we experienced directly and we, we sort of unconsciously knew it was going on, but we weren't talking about it per se. But a week or two after, um, we were talking about the euphoria that was created in all of us to have that realization and the fact that it's uh, it's bigger than all of us and it's something that is part of developing this new stage of consciousness so uh, I don't know Joel I you get you, the last yeah let, let's just let Joel have the last word here and then we'll oh, got it what a day who, who am I but uh, uh, this is a very, very beautiful image, the defender of justice. 
uh, when you said that Colleen found the, the, the feather of justice. I think uh, the sculptures are uh, valuable. I, I should correct myself, Joel. It's the feather of truth. It's truth. not justice. The feather it's of truth. truth. Yes. Yeah. The I, I know I said it as justice, but I, I misspoke. She found the feather of truth. You know, justice doesn't truth. bring you truth, right? Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, Egyptian mythology. Uh, we found the feather in the Egyptian mythology, the feather of truth. I like very much that image and uh, uh, the, the, you mentioned five sculptures. Uh, the, 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 those sculptures are valuable uh, psychological documents. Um, I would love to see the, the pictures of those sculptures if it, it is possible. Okay, let me, but, let me uh, see if I can find them quickly. I, I may have them. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I have I have photographed uh, them all. Unfortunately, I'm I don't necessarily know the order of them, and so um, I did. I actually made video of of uh, Colleen describing them. Uh, let me see if I can get back to them. They're in my. There we go. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, what, what's the Wednesday group? What Wednesday you, group is uh, what advanced reading group. Pardon? It's 1 p.m. Wow. One to three Eastern time. I think then you're in Brazil. That would be two p.m. Because I think yeah. you're in Atlantic Standard Time, one hour ahead of Eastern. Is that correct? Right. Now is almost twelve o'clock p.m. Oh, twelve no, two o'clock, fourteen o'clock. Oh, you're two hours ahead now. Two hours ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, until hours. we change our time, we'll change our time next month. Uh, in the wintertime, you're two hours ahead. In the summertime, one oh, hour. Yeah, with our daylight uh, savings, right? Okay. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna do a screen share again. I'm gonna show my photos, and I'll just tell you what these uh, images are. Okay. So this is one image of Colleen with uh, one of the pieces. I think this is one of the early pieces, and uh, here. Um, the you know the goddess, if you will, that's trying to find the truth is blindfolded as the statue of justice is. Uh, you can see that she has a feather here, and she has a snake uh, at the bottom, and she's got her foot on the snake, uh, holding back evil, um, and. Um, and so here, it's called Justice and the Feather of Truth. And uh, here's one of the other pieces. They have common elements. They're all blindfolded and they all involve a snake and they all involve the apple of, of knowledge. Um, knowledge of truth and evil, let's see. Yeah, that's the same one. And, uh, and then this image uh, contains and you would have to expand it, but it has the full story uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat obfuscated in the sense that uh, I think that I'm one of the few people that, that uh, Colleen has actually shared her perception of what happened now uh, with uh, and that's her story to tell and I will not speak it. But um, if you go back to this video, uh, you should be able to uh, 
make a screenshot of this and expand it so that you can uh, okay. read it. But that's her discussion of it. So the, this is the this is the discussion of all five the, the development of her psyche uh, and uh, and the the fifth one uh, I can just read them the steps to you uh, first is a call to justice where she's feeling this call that she didn't get justice in Rome. And then she's waiting for justice. Uh, then uh, the enunciation of the feather of truth, she understands that it involves the feather of truth. Um, and she does refer to Isis here and the Egyptian model. And then uh, the fourth piece is justice and the feather of truth portrays her acceptance of the inevitable outcome. She knows now that it is not up to her to exact a final justice. Uh, over time, truth will exact justice. Meanwhile, seeking truth, she conti uh, continues to remain, uh, let me read that word touching this, uh, oh, she remains touching the state snake of dark knowledge while at the same time holding it. Uh, okay, uh, so that's that. And I'm gonna have to wrap this up. So hold on. I kind of, can you hold on a minute? Yeah, hold on a second. Uh, I, I have to close this out because I have a call, a business call that I must take. So. Uh, I'll see Thanks you next you week. Take care. Peace. Thank you. Peace. Peace.